uh, feeling and consciousness, leaving aside uh, Dawid's uh, uh, um, speech about funding and the very interesting proposals from the Templeton. Um, uh, well, obviously, I'm not going to tell you that I know exactly the answers for consciousness because I want to get funding from Dawid to <laughs> know more about consciousness. But nonetheless, I'm going to talk about feeling and consciousness, two words that are not usually uh, spoken together. And what I would like to, to do is tell you that they should be spoken together. Uh, and in fact, there is no way of talking about feeling without talking about consciousness, because what, how would we know that we have feelings if we were not conscious? Uh, and this, this other side is more complicated. There's no way of talking about consciousness, in my view, if you don't have feeling also. In th that's really an inseparability there. So let's start with what is feeling. Um, feelings that you will all recognize. Well-being, malaise, hunger, thirst, desire, pleasure, fatigue, the sense of energy or the sense of flourishing. These are all examples of the most fundamental kind of feelings that in fact tend not to be thought about as feelings. You know, you, you talk about them, but you don't refer to them as feelings. But they are, and they are what I call homeostatic feelings, because what they translate mentally is the state of life within a living organism. They in fact translate the state of play of homeostasis. And homeostasis is a a word that I'm sure that most of you know, but for those who might not, uh, it really is that set of principles that allows life processes to continue in such a way that life continues and that does not derive into disease or uh, death. Um, so uh, this fact that the fundamental aspects of feelings uh, are related to the mental expression of the state of our life and the governance of our life is absolutely critical and people tend not to think of that. Uh, one, one of the ways is that very often feelings are very closely directed to feelings, for example, of emotions, which is a, a whole different uh, level of organization of effect. Uh, those tend to dominate the, the conversation about effect and, and feeling, but these fundamental ones are more critical for reasons that we'll get into in, in no time. Um, so feelings are conscious of necessity. Try to think about what it would be like to have a feeling that would not be conscious, and I'm sure that you cannot come up with. Um, next important point, feelings are not trivial matters. Um, in fact, there's no one here in this room, and we've, we have already had uh, interesting hints of that in some of the prior talks. No one here would have pain and not want to treat it, except on circumstances that would be highly pathological, and there was a reference, a very interesting one, to anorexia nervosa, where things of that sort can happen, but they are pathologic. So when we have pain, we want to reduce it, we want to get rid of it, and when we, want, when we have pleasure, we want to hold on to it, uh, and a lot of our lives are governed by feelings that are telling us precisely what we should or should not do. Very good example, the hunger or thirst that you feel at any moment. Um, next, uh, feelings um, uh, are most of the time ignored in the conversation on cognition. Most of the time that one talks about brain and mind or about mind in general, which is of course the theme of this uh, uh, meeting, uh, feelings are bypassed uh, as if they were not central, as if they were peripheral, as if they were something accessory in our minds. We spend a tremendous amount of time, and justifiably so, talking about perception, about the way we reason, about the way we uh, construct memories, about the way we retrieve them, about the way we generate narratives and translate them uh, verbally or not, about the way we make decisions, uh, and even about consciousness. And yet, you bypass feelings very easily. It's really not central to the conversation. So let me, the, 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 my, my point here is to tell you about the consequences of this bypass. First consequence, 
it allows us to ignore the centrality of non-neural biological processes in the construction of our minds. It's interesting, just think about how common it is for us to refer to minds as coming from brains, as minds as the result of brain function. How many of us tend to think of uh, uh, minds as coming in very good part out of non-neural biological processes. Um, another consequence of the bypass, it blocks from view the history of living beings. Now, living beings have existed on the face of the earth for at least four billion years. We have had single cell organisms that have been in existence with characteristics of their function and organization without a nervous system, uh, with, in many of them without, without even a nucleus, and they have, in spite of all of that, been there without nervous systems and organized and produced incredible feats of behavior control and incredible feats even of sociality. Now just think of the fact that we have had nervous systems on the face of the earth for something like 500 million years. Compare that to four billion years of life on earth. And brains like ours, a couple of hundred million years, and it's not really like ours, to, to, to be clear. So the, the, the obscuring this view of life on earth uh, is uh, one of the things that happens because of the fact that we bypass feeling, because feeling puts us directly in line and in key with living processes. Um, the bypass of feeling also helps perpetuate the myth, the myth that minds are constructed from the brain alone and by the brain alone. And yet a much more plausible scenario is that minds are constructed from a cooperation of non-neural and neural events that uh, exist very intensely and that, of course, neuroscience and biology in general are revealing all the time. And finally, the bypass also blocks our view of the critical connection of feeling and consciousness. Now, in order to say something about that, I need to tell you what my view of consciousness is. And again, we're going to forget about Dawid uh, Potkider on this matter. Um, what do I mean? It's ridiculous to try to explain what one thinks of consciousness inside of a 10 minute talk, and yet there are two parts to a very quick definition that I'm gonna give you. It's the process by which ongoing mental processes, the process that I mentioned to a while ago, for example, perception, the making of memories, reasoning, the construction of narratives, the making of decisions, all of cognition in fact, are referred to the owner of those processes. And the owner of those processes, for lack of a better word, is a self. Now, the self is a tremendously complicated concept and I don't want you to waste too much time with that because it has many levels and, uh, and many times uh, people get very confused uh, and worked up about the word self. But it's that referral of our cognition to this central critical uh, entity called the self that is one of the key aspects of the definition of consciousness. Uh, and the other part has to do with the value of that. Uh, so when you define consciousness, even very simply and curtly, I want to make sure that I tell you not only what it tends to be, but also what it is for because there's still many people that think that consciousness is useless and it is you know, something with, without which we might not live, uh, not, not, uh, uh, you know, not miss, uh, and that's obviously nonsense. Uh, and the, 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 the fact is that that referral is part of the assistance that the process gives us to maintain life. And I just gave you actually, when I was talking about feeling some of the examples, uh, if you were not conscious of the fact that you are hungry, which happens to be determined by the biochemistry of the moment, you would not be able to go and eat because you would not have this very, very complex phenomenon that not only allows you to perceive something that is going on in your organism, but also forces you, impels you to a certain behavior. That's part of the complexity of feeling. So, Feelings and being conscious are not useless things. They're things that 
are actually critical for the governance of our life, which really means that they are in the line of homeostasis. They are in the line of maintaining life in a way that can be continued for as long as our genome will allow it to be continued within the circumstances in which we, 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 we live. Um, and the, now we go to the final point, and then I'm going to shut up, uh, and that is how is this done and how does feeling intervene in the process of consciousness? Because the two things really come at the same time. And here I would say the following. Feeling is critical for this bizarre, and that's the word I would use uh, uh, scientifically, for this bizarre perception that we have of what is going on in our own organism and that allow us to create something that, for lack of a better word, I will call being. Uh, and it, it is very bizarre because when we talk about perception and when we talk about it respecting what the word usually means, we realize that it has a, a subject and an object. Well, the beauty of what, or the beauty and the, the, the strangeness of what happens with, with, uh, with feeling and consciousness is that we actually have at the same time, in complete collusion, you have an object and a subject. And it is out of this, let's call it confusion, if you want, um, of, of this confusion of subject and object, because the object of the perception that gives us feeling and consciousness is our body, but at the same time, we are in that body as subjects. And it is out of this that you generate this situation of, of being, and, and this really calls attention to the fact that this is primordial, it's really a beginning, and I'm not very fond of, of, of establishing rigid uh, uh, arrangements of processes, but nonetheless, I think this is a foundational process. For those of you that have read some of what I've written about consciousness, you will know that there are other things that intervene, many interesting processes that go on in the brain, such as, for example, creating a reference of our whole body in the form of a structured map that allows the processes then to be localized at a cognitive level. That's all very interesting and important, but nonetheless, that's not the key. That's not the beginning. The beginning is this, and this beginning, by the way, is something that I expect to be highly available in nature, and it's not going to be available for creatures that do not have nervous systems, but it's going to be available for any creature that has a complex enough nervous system, which really means that social insects have it, and that bacteria probably don't. One reason being the lack of metrics, the lack of mapping capabilities for creatures like bacteria that do not have a nervous system and that do not have the capacity for neural representations. And the very final comment uh, that I'm going to make, and this actually connects very well with Alison Gopnik's uh, prior talk, is the following. We have just published in Nature Machine Intelligence a paper that's with myself and one of my colleagues, Kings and Mann. We have just published a paper whose title is Homeostasis, Soft Robotics, and the Making of Feeling Machines. And the point of that paper is actually very similar to the point that Alison was making. She was making the beautiful point that artificial intelligence, like everybody in this room knows, is both wonderful and has serious limitations, and that if we're going to have an artificial intelligence that is truly intelligent in the way that we are intelligent, we have to have certain cognitive aspects and certain aspects of the structure that turn out to be turn out to go in the direction of vulnerability and weakness as opposed to perfection. So uh, Alison was pointing to how a three-year-old, uh, even before that, you will have this immense disorganization, this, this aspect of behavior that you would say, well, what a pity, it's not really concentrating the way it should. Well, it's marvelous that it's not concentrating the way it should and it's not restricting possibilities because what it is doing instead is something marvelous which is this huge ability to connect things that uh, an adult will not connect because an adult is going to be rigid in terms of the nervous system as opposed to the, to the, the young child. Now, one of the, the in, in, in uh, 
parallel to this, there is this enormous vulnerability and weakness that is introduced by our own feelings. Imagine that we didn't have them. We would be, you know, we would be rigid structures and uh, contrary to what one might think, it is the, this weakness and this vulnerability that is in fact going to have a huge payoff in permitting through flexibility a variety of arrangements that can be truly intelligent and that mostly connect with that fundamental intelligence that I referred to that comes out of the combination of feeling and the inevitable consciousness that occurs along with feeling. So it's something that you may want to take a look at, uh, to read the paper and tell me what you think. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>